Good afternoon, everybody. This is the Offshore Site Investigation and Geotechnics and the, energy, and the Energy Transition, the Changing Face of Offshore Survey. Um, my name is Mick Cook, and I'm going, to be moderating, I'm going to be moderating the session today. Just a bit of background on myself. Uh, after completing an MSc Marine Geophysics, Geotechnics and Oceanography at Bangor University in 1979, I spent approximately 40 years now working in the offshore energy sector. Um, initially as a partner and director, I played an integral part uh, in building HydroSearch, which was a consultancy, a geoscience and environment consultancy. Um, we built this over 20 years into the largest of its kind, uh, and we sold out to the RPS group in 2003, on which point I was appointed managing director of the newly formed RPS Energy Division, and then spent the next five years or so building that uh, partly through organic and partly through acquisition. And uh, um, I decided to leave in 2008 and form my own consultancy. Um, over the past 13 years or so now, I've been advising a number of different companies in the offshore sector, approximately 20 in total. And I hold a number of uh, different uh, um, non-executive board positions. And I'm actively involved in M&A activities uh, in terms of um, the Society for Underwater Technology, I'm a council member and treasurer, and I was for approximately 10 years in the 1990s, uh, the actual chairman of the Offshore Site Investigation and Geotechnics Group. So uh, that's it from me. I'm now going to get the panellists um, that are actually on this call today to introduce themselves. And starting with um, Nadine, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Thank you, Mick. Good afternoon. My name is Nadine Robinson. I'm the Technical Advisor on Environmental Sustainability at um, IMCA, the International Marine Contractors Association. Most of you um, who are joining on the call on this panel discussion today are probably familiar with us, but just a few words for um, those of you who are not. IMCA is an industry association representing the vast majority of marine contracting companies globally. In fact, we have over 700 member companies around the world. IMCA has a long-standing track record for producing authoritative technical guidance through our numerous committees and at any one time we have approximately 600 people engaged um, across our, our various committees. We have um, three committees of particular relevance um, to today's panel, each is supported by a dedical technical advisor like myself. First, we have um, a Renewable Energy Committee, which is convened by my colleague Andy Goldsmith um, and has been in existence for over a decade. Uh, we also have a Survey Committee, which is convened by my colleague Nick Hoff. So for any technical queries on these areas, these are the people you want to be in touch with. Um, at IMCA, I lead our Environmental Sustainability Strategy and our program of engagement with members on an environment and the energy transition. So this includes convening our environmental sustainability commi committee and we have a diverse group of 20 individuals from around the world um, who are environmental experts across 14 of our member companies and I've had the pleasure of working with them over the past 18 months where we um, we originally first set up as a pilot committee and were escalated by our board last year to become a core committee and that reflects the strategic importance of environmental sustainability and of, of, of interest today the energy transition to both IMCA and our members. In fact, environmental sustainability is one of IMCA's five strategic priorities. So I'm here um, in a slightly different capacity than, than, than Mick and the other panelists. Um, I'm here to bring an environmental lens to our discussion. And I've worked on environment and climate since my master's 25 years ago, nationally, internationally, in academia, the private sector government and international organizations. And I've also been a shipping finance lawyer. So I have a multidisciplinary background and it's great to be here as part of a multi stakeholder panel to talk about the energy transition and how the changing face of not only offshore survey, but marine contracting as a whole. Finally, I've witnessed um, over my career how as an environmental sustainability and the energy transition have become mainstream issues for business. This is in sharp contrast to when I am um, early on in my career when I was at UNDP uh, 20 years ago and we had one climate change advisor globally. You couldn't imagine that today. And um, so to meet the challenges and opportunities of the energy transition as a marine contracting industry, including our, the survey community, I think it's really important we have shared understanding of what is expected of our industry and to share good practices and lessons learned. And this is why multi-stakeholder panels like this one today, bringing diverse perspectives are so critical to building shared understanding and to taking effective action. So at IMCA, we've been taking action in this area, but um, I will leave that to come to a little bit later in the panel discussion today. So thank you. Thanks very much, Nadine. That's uh, 
good start. Um, could um, you, uh, Neil, please uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, I will do. Thank you, Mick. I, I was wondering who's coming next. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm Neil Morgan. I'm the geotechnical team leader uh, and also technical authority for geotechnics within Lloyd's Register. Most of my day-to-day um, -day work is involved in certification of uh, offshore structures, either fixed or floating, and, and in particular, increasingly so for offshore wind. Um, I look at all foundation types, anchoring, site investigation data, quite a, a broad range of interest in offshore geotechnics. Um, aside from that, I'm also chair of the Offshore Site Investigation and Geote Geotechnics Committee, um, which is within the SUT, which is uh, quite a large network of people who meet regularly to discuss um, offshore geotechnical or offshore geophysical related issues. And in, indeed, the integration of those two bits of data is always a, a popular topic. Um, very shortly, uh, uh, for, I don't know, for about 10 years, I've been chair of TP4 on uh, offshore pile design for ISO standards uh, and I'll shortly take over as convener of working group 10 for the ISO committee or for the ISO standards that looks at geotechnical content of, of offshore standards. So we're certainly, um, the industry is thinking increasingly from a, a renewables point of view there in terms of design practice. I suppose my, my other interests um, include research and development on um, novel foundation types, um, things like suction buckets, uh, but also on things like pile capacity, uh, more contemporary methods, including new PY curve methodology, um, axial capacity, um, all of those things that, that kind of um, translate into amounts of steel basically required to develop things. Um, so from that point, I'll, I'll hand back to Mick. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, Phil, do you want to give a short introduction to yourself? Hi, thanks, Mick. Uh, Phil Wilson. I'm the panel director with MMT uh, and now part of the Ocean Infinity Group. Uh, as MMT Ocean Infinity, we're a marine survey contractor covering a full range of disciplines from geophysics, geotechnics, environmental survey and UXO survey and inspection and also inspection of structures. Uh, I've been in the industry for 25 years, uh, working in the offshore marine environment in uh, construction, engineering, air sciences, uh, and been working in the survey sector for 15 plus years, uh, predominantly in uh, commercial, uh, working for contractors. Uh, like other members of the panel here, I'm part of the Offshore Site Investigation and Geotechnics Committee, uh, and also an active member of the <clears throat> Renewable UK, European Subsea Cables Association um, and also a fellow of the Geological Society. Uh, as, a, as a contractor, we're, we're very closely watching and, and fo not following uh, the, the transition, the energy transition, and it really is gathering very significant pace and momentum. And uh, we're certainly, as a contractor, developing our capabilities and our offering to, to deliver upon that. And uh, as part of the Ocean Infinity team, we're, we're strongly going down the path of marine robotics and re use of remote operation center uh, as a transition from what we see today as conventional survey. So we're, we're future proofing ourselves for the, for the growth of the sector and uh, the technology development within the sector. And it's a delight to be part of this panel. So thank you, Mick, for asking me to join. Thanks very much, Phil. Um, last but not least, uh, could you introduce yourself, please, um, Andy? Hi there, yeah, I'm Andy Barwise. I'm Principal Geotechnical Engineer with RWE Renewables. Um, I've been involved in offshore geotechnics and site investigation for 30 years now, again, since I completed my master's at Bangor University many, many years ago. Um, and, and since then, I've been involved in working both for contractors through consultancy and, and ultimately now with a developer focusing purely on offshore renewables. Um, and wh whether that be fi fixed bottom or floating. Um, so, yeah, I've really seen over that career of 30 years sort of transition from a, a pure reliance on, on oil and gas. I seem to have lost you, Andy. <laughs> development phases. Um, and sort of seeing that from our sort of now global portfolio of, of wind farms and projects we have in development, sort of seeing that 
escalation of size and scale from those sort of early days of two or three hundred um, megawatt projects mo moving on up to sort of where we are now with sort of latest round threes of sort of three gigawatt projects and that sort of order of magnitude step change and and I think from our side really getting that perspective of those you know those sites now are sort of upwards of a thousand square kilometers of area of site for development leases um, so yeah I, I think from our changing face of offshore survey for this uh, topic really is moving towards these what you know what we'll refer to as these mega sites and just enormous volumes of seafloor that we we have to we have to understand and we have to engineer and, and de-risk and ultimately as you say from from neil's side of the business come up with a sustainable foundation that is certifiable for for a safe operation of, of offshore renewable developments that's great thanks andy uh but you'll see that we've got a very very nice uh, mix um, of panelists the format of of today's discussion will be um, a short introduction from myself about what um, the discussions are all going to be about. Um, we will then actually come on to some of the issues that we actually see with the energy transition, and we'll have a panel discussion on that. And then there'll be an opportunity towards the end of this session uh, for um, the people that are actually watching and listening to put their own questions. I see, I see we've got one question already. Um, if you do have questions, you'll find a box uh, below the media viewer where you can actually put your questions and towards the end of this session we will be we will be selecting some of those questions and we'll be putting those questions to the panel for their answers so without further ado just a bit of an introduction uh, from myself um i think i mentioned earlier on i've been in the business now for well over 40 years uh, and i've seen an awful lot of change in that time but certain things haven't changed um the um, physics and the geology that we look at has actually changed very little. In fact, many of the systems we use today are actually based on systems we used 40 odd years ago. Um, there's been a lot of refinement and there have been quite a lot of innovation. But a lot of systems are actually not far different to what they were when I first started. So, um, but over that 40 years, lots of things have changed. And uh, just to pick out a few, um, the quality of the vessels now that we utilize to acquire data offshore has improved enormously from when I first started in the uh, industry. Um, we've had a digital re revolution. When I first started, a lot of the data we acquired was actually analog data. Uh, digitizing that data has enabled us to process, look at that data in a lot more detail than we ever used to. And also uh, the advent of computers. When I first started, computers were a new thing, uh, but now we're able to display uh, what we find, our interpretations, et cetera, in all sorts of different ways. And uh, um, the improvements in the quality of data and the way we represent it has improved enormously. But, but probably the biggest thing that's changed over my 40 years really is the application of offshore survey. Um, there were rapid advances 40, 50 years ago when we started to look for oil and gas offshore. And a lot of the developments we've seen probably from about 1970 to um, at the turn of the century, really, have been developed within the offshore oil and gas sector. But as we all know, things are changing very, very rapidly. With the advent of offshore wind, which was in the, the late 90s, uh, started initially offshore Denmark. In the UK here, we had the two, the two wind turbines up live and then Scroby Sands. Um, during the past 21 years or so, we've seen enormous developments in offshore wind. Uh, the application of offshore survey to offshore wind is actually very, very different to what are lots of things we've experienced in oil and gas. We've got very, very large sites, numerous development locations. The timescales have become compressed more and more and more. Uh, and that, what that has raised is that as we increase in offshore wind, if Marianne can put the graph up, we can actually see that... Uh, we can see this is just a graph showing uh, the increase in offshore a forecast um, global offshore wind growth up to 1930. If we were to extend that to 2050, we'd see a similar graph. In other words, exponential growth. Thanks, Marion. Um, what, what that has done now, that's created a number of challenges for us. Uh, and probably the biggest challenge really is 
uh, uh, we're actually all um, very, very stretched at present to meet the demands of the current industry. As we can see from that graph, it's going to grow enormously over the years. So there's going to be issues. Where do we get vessels, the new vessels from? Where do we get the equipment from? But probably more importantly, where are, are we going to get the personnel that actually are able to not only operate and analyze the data that we acquire, um, but, but also to make, make the decisions that, uh, um, that enable us uh, to put more and more offshore wind turbines in place in more and more sort of deep water. So um, if we are to succeed, then we've got to really, really scale up. And to do that, I think with an offshore survey, we've got to work a lot more smarter. We've got, we've got to challenge the status quo to minimize the constraints that we have in actually performing offshore survey. And we've got to really get trained an awful lot more people. And it's all got to be done sustainably. We're in a, a world now where everybody is conscious of the environment. And whatever we do, we've got to do in an em environmentally sustainable way. And Nadine, I'm sure going through this discussion, we'll have some points to make on that. So if we can get to the, uh, the main crux now of the discussion, uh, there's a number of issues we'd like, like to raise. I'd like to get the views of the panel. And the first one really is the major, the, the major item, which is how do we actually scale up in terms of vessels, equipment, and personnel? Um, and I think what I'd like to do initially is get a developer's viewpoint. So Andy, if you could actually just uh, put into context where you see the issues are, and then maybe we can get the other panelists to, uh, uh, to, um, to add their thoughts as to how we can actually achieve what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Uh yeah, thank, thanks, Mick. And I, and I think, as you say, I mean, that's, you know, picture tells a thousand words and seeing that sort of exponential global growth in, you know, we, we read in the press pretty well every day that each each country and each area is, is setting more and more ambitious targets for uh, renewable energy and, and, and the bulk of that being an offshore renewable development. And that, that speed of growth of developments is, you know, I, I think those of us in the site investigation industry get the get the hit first in, in many respects because the, the early phases of all developments is is understanding the site, understanding those risks that would lead to consenting, you know, whether that's a, it, environmental seafloor risks, UXO, archaeology, uh, geological. So, so understanding what you need to know on a site is, is it a site to take forwards. And so we, we really get first in on projects or development areas and I think you know when you start to look at global maps of where offshore renewables is going I and mean, I think from from my side as a, a developer and looking at portfolios of, of projects it's you know is is the supply chain really there from the site investigation contractors who you know and I guess they'll 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 agree there they're already currently busy and, and stretched and I, and I think the, the crux of that is, is is not just vessel days in the water i mean I, th I think everyone lives in the ideal world where a vessel will be busy 365 days a year but you know globally typhoons hurricanes winter seasons that that's not realistic for data acquisition um but i think what we need to consider is actually as and you touched on the good point mick is you know from from my side as a developer it, it's not getting a vessel into the water it's getting a report delivered to our desk to start the the engineering studies with that data and, and you know that lag between completion of survey to completion of report and when I I think from when I first started work I actually think that's increasing and, and whether that be down to the complexity of laboratory testing or analysis we undertake on work but I you know some of these time scales are growing rather than shrinking and i think that's where we need to start to look at smarter solutions it's, you know it, you, you can't really change the speed of data acquisition i think since we started drill drill ships give or take will drill a similar amount of meters a day and geophysical acquisition is at four knots or whatever the efficient survey speed is some fundamentals can't change you can get smarter about how much you do with the data and what you do with the data but I, I, I think we we are going to struggle in actually getting usable engineering value data um, globally 
Um, you know, I think we talk, we'll talk about integration. I think we're now working in integrated teams where we don't put geophysicists and geotechnical engineers and geology all in separate buildings. We do, we do work from integrated teams now. But I think the integration on global standards as well, that is a site investigation specified for North Sea, is that suitable for the US? Is it suitable for the Far Eastern market? And an alignment of specifications is also an important topic as well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Andy. I think the point of time scale is going to come on to later, so I'll park that one. But I think I'll pass over to Phil now. And uh, Phil, how do you answer Andy's initial questions? Where are the vessels, uh, the equipment, the people are going to come from? Thanks, uh, Mick and Andy. I think maybe just stepping back a little bit, what we have seen as a as a contractor, and of course the developers will see us as well, is is how we're using the data has fundamentally changed when you move from an oil and gas development, for example, through to offshore wind development, because there's a, a much larger geographic footprint on an offshore wind development and much for more touch points with the seabed in terms of each turbine having a foundation as opposed to maybe one platform with four piles. We're now on sites where 100 turbines with 100 piles. So the, the spatial area and, and interaction of the seabed is increasing as well with that transition. So what we have seen is that the data, how the data is used is, is changing. Uh, so, you know, we are now seeing you know much the development of the ground model and the integrated teams that Andy talked about that's fundamental for being able to deliver upon the requirements so as geophysicists as geotechnical engineers environmental scientists the, ge the, the foundation specialists we all have to work together as part of an integrated team to develop that ground model but you have to think about the components that go into that ground model as well so, you know, important in the geophysics side to spec the geophysics survey to, to give you that spatial variability across the site. So we routinely see now that for a for wind farm, we're shooting a 2D ultra high resolution data to give a quality and re, re, high resolution data in the foundation zone. Um, so that's fundamental for building that ground model. Um, and you know, whereas in the oil and gas sector, we maybe didn't see so much of that. And the, the, the 2D, uh, the HR data was focused on much deeper penetration. Uh, but it's really now looking at ultra high resolution data that goes into that ground model. Uh, and also then in terms of the geotechnics, you know, that the move away that we don't necessarily need a borehole at every foundation location. So there's a much more increased use of the CPT data. And, and a push from industry to, to, to drive these seabed CPTs uh, to, to, to the foundation depth as well. So there's a development there in terms of, of the equipment that we use. But to, to come back to the point about this growth, so I think there's a combination, there's a bit of a double whammy because A, there's the growth of the, the scale of the offshore wind, but also the actual requirement for survey in that sector is probably significantly more than what we've seen in oil and gas. We've got a bit of a triple whammy that we're having to deal with. And absolutely, there, you know, there is concerns around resource constraint. Um, I think there's, there's a combination of factors there. I think, you know, of course, vessels can be built, more equipment can be built, but it does come to the, the person perspective as to how to, to operate that. And also probably the the confidence of the contractor to make the capital expenditure. Uh, so I think, you know, whilst we see a lot of government targets, we want to ensure that that's a consistent pipeline of projects that we're seeing. We need to look at the opportunities to extend that survey season. So as a contractor, it's very difficult to, to resource up for a somewhere in a sort of a seven to nine month season. We need to look at what how we can operate year round uh, by different methods, whilst not uh, deteriorating the quality of the data that we acquire. So there's some new technology there we need to consider to increase that weather or that year round working, which smooths the curve a little bit. Um, and in terms of the people perspective, I think we also need to think about how we do this differently, which is what we see in the transition now across to the thinking about robotic vessels and about remote operation centers. That has a role to play because, you know, I think with the, with the 
the millennials coming on, everybody's got a different perspective now, maybe than what we had 40 years ago on on work life balance. And uh, but if we can get people working from remote operation centres as opposed to offshore, we get the benefit of you know a maybe attracting more people to the industry, but also then be retaining them people in the industry once their sort of com- personal commitment to move on, if their ability to be able to work from shore as opposed to having to go offshore for four or six weeks at a time. So that's an element of it, but it doesn't solve the whole problem. It's 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 building. With it. I think another critical part is really right even at school level to, to to just really push the stem agenda in terms of uh, pushing that right from school level and to show i think you know the, the millennials and the and the, the gen the centennials that are coming on of course they're very environmentally aware but we maybe need to put that in context you know in terms of yes environmentally aware but you know to deliver upon that how are you going to deliver as opposed to this you know, we're all environmentally aware, but what is your role in delivering that? What is the role in offshore wind or or renewables in delivering that? And how can you play a part in that industry? And to really push the STEM agenda right from school level and also then in, into the university courses that we're seeing to bring more people into the sector. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Some really good points there. Uh, and um, we've actually covered a number of things we're going to cover actually moving forward through this discussion. So you've actually already touched on quite a lot of those. Um, Nadine, how do we do this environmentally sustainably? <laughs> well, I think the first thing that's really important is that we need to have um, clear expectations on on what is expected of the survey community and what is expected of, of contractors as, as a whole. And um, that's one of the things that, that struck me when I joined IMCA just over a year and a half ago, is that we didn't have a common approach to environmental sustainability. So each of the, um, and our environmental committee felt it was really important that we come together and actually share our experiences and and, and look at what, what the expectations were. So, so we did this um, by developing a, a recommended code of practice on environmental sustainability, which sets the um, expectations, not only on the decarbonization piece, but um, also on the um, environmental side, including sort of biodiversity loss, ex- habitat um, disturbance, etc. And we, um, and it was pretty remarkable because we, we when we we set out to do this, we first had a brainstorm in in November last year, and we brought um, um, our interested members together. So it kind of cast the net widely, and some other members who weren't part of our committee came on board, and we identified um, sort of I guess six key areas that were material to um, to, to the marine contracting industry so that was obviously the emissions reduction piece which is is um with them um, with, with our vessels that's um likely where the greatest impact lies but then that goes hand in hand with um energy efficiency and, and and management so we tried to look at what practical measures could be taken there we also looked at um how do we engage our supply chain or value chain which we've already sort of um briefly touched on uh, we looked at um how do you adopt a circular economy approach so how do you move from um a, a a linear approach to to a more circular approach um, and we consider that in the context not only of um, waste management also but in terms of end of life um, products and then we looked at how um, one sort of fundamental piece was how do we know whether we're doing better or worse which is the the reporting side of it so you can't um, I always believe that how do you, you can't manage something unless um, effectively unless you measure and monitor it and that should resonate quite well with the with the survey um, community given the nature of your work and what what's particularly important is is that we we need to be able to track our progress so so that's sort of why we we decided that we needed to come together as as an industry to produce a recommended code of practice to set these are the expectations across um the 700 or so imca imca members of what we need to what we need to do and where we need to make progress where where are the priorities because otherwise if we don't set those expectations we haven't established a baseline to measure whether we're doing better or worse so then how can we um um, assess whether we're ready to meet those those challenging 2050 targets and um, more importantly the the interim ones I think we, we won't be um, at, um, in 2050 it's going to be exactly those uh, those millennials and, and, and other workforce that are go- going to, to to be working so how do we work within the the um, and, and work within a period of, of uncertainty as well so it's been really um, 
important that that we we specify that and and that's received received a lot of traction and then the next step for us is to, to then go through and, and and develop some guidance off the off the back of that and that could for example include guidance specifically for how does the the code apply say to the the survey community or um to other aspects of of, of imca's um imca's work but um we do believe that um everyone working in this area all of all of the companies whether it's a survey company or, or, or a contractor has um needs to deliver on their responsibility in terms of environmental uh, um, the environmental sustainability and i think that it's not just the why we're doing it so those end goals in terms of net zero 2050 etc that um it's also how we do it so ensuring that what we're doing today is is, is equally sustainable so it's not only the 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 long-term um, rationale or or um why but the but the how that's key And I think I'll stop there. Yeah, thank, thanks, Nadine. Yeah, I think I think you touched on the most important point right at the end there is the how. We'll come on to that hopefully later in the discussion. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't heard from you for a while. Um, as the uh, one of the persons that certifies these developments, um, what sort of thing, what sort of things do you think we can do to to help with this um, this massive increase in workload we're seeing coming and um, and how can we actually work a lot smarter to satisfy the likes of yourselves? Uh, I, I think um, picking up on quite a few of the discussions there, um, in terms of uh, collection of site investigation or use of site investigation data, a, a smart thing to do would be to um, really assess what you need in terms of data, what type of data, how much, where do you need it, and then only go and collect what's necessary from that to really make sure you target. Uh, I, I think oil and gas um, could get away with quite um, a blanket approach. They could just say, let's go and investigate more than we need, and then we'll just use what we get because just less developments. Wind, wind has obviously gone away from that and are much more optimized, but I suspect there's room now for um, newer like survey technology coming through. How can we integrate geotechnical data with that? How can we bring what we need from the, the investigation phase into the design phase uh, in a way that gives everything that you need for a, a, like a, an efficient design um, uh, without missing anything, without having to go back later and collect more? Uh, and I suppose um, I, I'm going to put an advert for the um, imminent update of the renewables guidelines to be published because that's um, one of the processes that we tried to build into that document is a very thorough assessment of what you need and why um, for all the different engineering purposes. And then you go out for your site investigation in a, a, a really quite a targeted way. So I suppose that's one way of um, managing um, or mitigating some of the shortage that may be there on survey is to try and target what you need much more effectively. Um, uh, coming back to your, your other point on people, uh, and I suppose the, the challenge there is to get the industry um, to think now for what they need in 10 or 15 years time in terms of having people with the right skills and abilities to make the decisions that often have very, very large impacts, um, tens or hundreds of millions. So the industry needs to think where it's going to get those people from to make the workforce and I suppose make a plan back from there. Um, will that happen? I'm not sure, but I suppose that's where we need to be. Yeah, thanks a lot, Neil, some good points there. Um, yeah, with regard to uh, um, this acceleration, uh, growth of the industry, et cetera, when we discussed this prior to this session, we talked about some of the existing constraints. I'd just like to move on to those now. And uh, when we did talk about this, we talked about the uh, the, exacting the exacting environmental requirements required for an offshore wind farm development when compared to maybe other applications. We also talked about some of the um, some of the constraints of the procurement process. And is that helping or is that hindering? And finally, we also touched on uh, um, unexploded ordnance and the impact that has had on the offshore wind industry. I'd just like to sort of touch on those three particular topics and. Um, Perhaps as a developer, Andy, someone who actually want, wants his data, lots of data, and you want it yesterday, perhaps you could touch on those and uh, give us your thoughts on that without without um, incriminating yourself with your, with your procurement <coughs> department. <laughs> yeah, no, that, 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 that's fine. I mean, I have some, some 
general comments on those topics. And, and I think, you know, I've, I've seen both sides of the industries, both from, from oil and gas and from renewables. So it, it's sort of speaking from having seen both sides of the fence. And I, th I think it's fair to say there is a, a slightly different approach to how site investigation is undertaken. And that, you know, com comes down perhaps to a, a risk approach to development. And I, I think, you know, partly the consenting process we have to go through for the offshore wind and the lease sides, you know, put, put different obligations on you as a developer for, you know, it, it's not necessarily what you deem required for a site. It, it's what we need to do to demonstrate that what we're doing isn't causing harm to a site. And, and so, we, you know, we do, do need to follow with the guidance. And I think rightly so when we talk about, you know, the sustainability, you know, because they're such big areas, I mean, there are areas of sensitive environmental habitat. I mean, we're, we're fully aware of that around the coasts of, of the UK. There's areas of archaeology which which need to be preserved for, for generations ahead. Um, and there is a large history of unexploded ordnance out there and, and the risks need to be managed proportionally. Um, and, and I think that different perspective of industries, and, and I guess probably from we might get some feedback from Phil, and I, I think you probably see slightly different requirements from different industries to what is required for a development. And, and, and you know, I don't necessarily think it's one being more risk averse than others, but I think we're following the practice that we we need to follow to make sure we we are given the permissions to develop our our infrastructure offshore. Um, and I, and I think you know, there's smarter ways of delivering that and I think what's done now from a UXO perspective it, it is perhaps starting to, to change in the, in the speed and type of surveys and, and how we look to, to manage that um, but you know certain things if you've if you've got a 500 square kilometer site or a thousand square kilometer site you, you can't get away from the fact you need to understand the full seafloor features from a environmental, archaeological and UXO risk and from a geohazards risk to un understand where to best place infrastructure. And those those sort of things will, will be part of your consent process, uh, understanding and how you're going to manage the site and ensure you don't damage the site. And I think from an oil and gas infrastructure basis, you know, they'll choose where to put a platform in the middle of a large lease. Uh, and I guess, you know, I'm not an expert in the directional drilling side, but you, you can you, you can still hit a target without being placed. If you have to, if you have to locate a platform off off the most desirable location, you, you can do that. Um, and then you've got your pipeline and seafloor infrastructure around that. But you, you actually interact as far as a seabed interaction with a far smaller area that, than we do from an offshore renewables side of things. And I think when we talk about changes and challenges i mean i think for those of you've tracked um site you know we talk about everything being exponential the growth and predicted growth of offshore turbines you know and a development program of, of offshore wind i mean that, that's one of the, the key areas as well that you know that the change in turbine size and technology is is incredible as well and and actually deciding where you're going to place structures often isn't known at the time you're doing a survey because the technology isn't there at the time you start to plan surveys. So, you know, th there's a lot of uncertainties we deal with um, uh, to keep flexibility. Which probably didn't really answer your question, but I'm guessing there isn't really an answer to the question. I don't, I don't think it's an answer. I think, I think there are views rather than answers, I think. And yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you skillfully managed to avoid the procurement question. Uh, but you did put Phil on the spot. So, Phil, from a contractor's perspective, how do you view things? No, I think absolutely, Mick. It, it's fundamental that given this growth that we're seeing, that we maybe step back a little bit and think, how do we collectively deliver what the project needs, what the developer needs to develop his project and work much more in a, like a collaboration environment? I think maybe a topical point, but you know, from a procurement perspective, we have to stop seeing survey as a commodity. Uh, we have to think about survey actually is it's about the value to the project, the quality of the service and, and the report that's delivered, 
not about the vessel that goes in the water. It's about the report that's delivered in the end of the day. And the danger with this, with the growth that we see is that we will probably see people seeing an opportunity there in the market and trying to step into the market and maybe not coming with that quality. We go down the procurement route where we're commodity based and uh, you know lowest price, once you pass a few criteria, it goes back to lowest price. And then you know a year or so down the line, the client's back collecting the same data because at the next stage of his development, he needs the, a better resolution. So I think we need to think from first principles, what does the project need to be able to deliver that, that construction stage and over the lifetime of the project? And from that perspective, think about what data we need to collect. So maybe even the move, you know, what we do we see is during the, the development process of a project that we are maybe in the field three times during that project, collecting similar data, if not the same data, because the project has evolved over the, the development timeline, either because of turbine size or because of some micro siting or some other criteria that's come up through that development process that changes the sort of siting slightly. So maybe you have to think back about this and to, to maybe invest more upfront in your survey. So for example, moving from a 2D ultra high resolution data set to a 3D high re, ultra high resolution, which you can then truly develop a 3D ground model where you can interrogate that model and see at every point how the ground conditions are varying across the site. So it will, it will enable micrositing and it will enable the ability to develop that without the need to go back out into the field to collect more data or the same data, but just in a slightly different way. So I think there's an area there and, and that, that ultimately is driven by how we procure that survey service, you know, in terms of going back to fundamentals a little bit. But it's, it's a challenge for developers because if we look at the different countries, there's different risks for the developers in developing this. So ultimately, if we're working in the UK sector, everything, all the survey work that we do up to the financial, uh, up to that sort of permitting stage is at risk to the developer. So we can understand the, the cost drivers to keep costs down during that process. But then ultimately, we also see the counter to that now that the prices that are being paid for the leases and maybe that changes that dynamic a little bit. So it is important that we, we get the procurement right and it's not considered to be a commodity. Building on that point a little bit, the, the other thing we see, you know, when we look at what is the biggest emissions that is, you know, when we're developing an offshore wind project, what, where does the highest emissions come from when we develop that project from a sustainability perspective? Of course, is the, the, the materials the, the wind farm has been built from, but a lot of the emissions come from the vessels that are used for the survey, for the installation, for all of these activities. And we, we see the sustainability agenda, but you know, again, to be maybe a little bit controversial from a procurement perspective, we need to see that emissions element having its teeth in the procurement process. So that if the, the, the developer really is driving a, a high sustainability project, there needs to be some criteria around the environmental credentials of the, the, the vessels that are used in the field or whatever to, to really look at re, uh, emissions reduction from those vessels. And you know, I thought from a contractor, from what we see is yes, the, the, the developer or the client wants it, but actually it's not then scored very highly in the, in the procurement process. So, you as a contractor if you have invested in new vessels or, or cleaner vessels or whatever you don't actually get that much traction from that for you you're still competing with maybe a vessel that's 30 40 years old when you look at it from a purely commodity basis and and the, then the final point on the uxo perspective it definitely there's an evolution needed because i think we as, as an offshore wind industry we are doing a lot more work around this UXO piece than we have seen in other industries. And ultimately, it's, it's a risk management exercise or a, or a risk perception exercise. And it really doesn't add that much value to the project. So we need to think about this a little bit smarter as to how to go about that. It's maybe, it's maybe a bit strange hearing this from a contractor saying we don't need to do all this survey, but there's enough survey work out there and bringing it back to the point about where are we going to get this resources, whatever to do it? Let's do, you know, meaningful fit for purpose and objective data collection uh, yeah, that, that really fulfills the needs of the project over the lifetime of the project and be much more, I don't know, op <laughs> optimize it a lot more. I'll, I'll close out my comments there.
Yeah, perhaps I perhaps I'll jump in there and put a bit of a plug in for the UXO Special Interest Group of the SUT that are that are currently uh, consists of developers. Um, and in fact, Andy sits on that committee, and uh, I think we are moving towards because it's not just you as a contractor feel that actually feels this is an issue. The, the developers feel it's an issue, and things things are moving on with that. Um, just in terms of what Phil had to say, do you have anything to add to that from an, from an IMCA perspective, Nadine? Sorry, I meant to unmute. Um, in the in the sense of, I think that um, we have um, we do a biannual survey of of our members, and um, I, I think in the this year's um, um, survey, we found that um, eighty, I think it's between eighty or ninety percent. Don't don't quote me on 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 which figure, but it's it's just definitely eighty or ninety percent of our members said that they are getting increasing demands for um for this type of information in the in the, in their tendering exercises. So um, that's I was actually going to put that back to um, uh, as as a question to Phil whether he he because he's saying that they're not using the criteria but are they are are, are they asking for it more and um, really is there a need for um, some sort of um, standardization of, of the information because the anecdotal evidence seems to suggest that um, the length of of the environmental and, and climate information that's being asked across our our con contractors is, is in detail a level of detail is is increasing. So maybe to respond to that, Nadine, yes, absolutely, we're seeing more and more of that coming through in the tender process. But what we then don't see is then how that data is actually used in the decision of the award. So they're asking for it, but then you see maybe some of the results of these tender processes and, you know, it's 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 there, but there's, it's got no teeth from a procurement perspective. You know, it's, the, the, it's, it's asked for and all contractors respond to that, but does that really then have an influence on the end decision of who's awarded the work or how the work is procured? We don't necessarily see that uh, coming through strongly, and I think this is why you know my comment. It doesn't, of course, cost and quality will always be key credentials, but we need to maybe build in some element of scoring exercise around the sustainability agenda as well in the procurement process. I, I think that just to add to that, Phil, sorry if you don't mind if I jump in. I mean, co cost and quality obviously is important, but I think one of the key criteria is, and I, I obviously can't talk about our scoring on, on how we score what, what we receive, but HSEQ is, you know, a, a really important part of any tender evaluation that, that you know, the, the, co the cost side of it, if you can't go out and do it, safely and safety isn't just you know no, no harm to people there's also no harm to the environment as well so i mean it, it's yeah I, I would think from our side it's you know it is something which is considered and obviously we can't feed back what criteria are used but hseq uh, and yeah you know safety nowadays is, isn't is include includes that safe safe to the environment so i, I think it is is wrapped up in those um, elements, but I, I also think just to quickly add a point on that as well, we're also in, and it comes back to the, the supply. You know, we're in an industry where if we put in fairly onerous environmental controls that all vessels used in offshore survey and site investigation sh shall burn X percent of biofuel and be clean burn and be under 10 years old, the site investigation industry is pretty quickly going to stop overnight you know it maybe you'll keep going in the north sea or some uh, some areas but certainly some areas you, you wouldn't have a vessel to meet those requirements yeah i mean you said you sit in a different position to the rest of the world, but you've got any sort of observations of what's been said so far on that i, I think um like phil said i suppose if you're going to get a survey you need to think what value you get from it uh, and that i suppose um I, 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 kind of uh, defines how much importance people put on collecting the data of the right quality and then think about how you use that through the design process to make sure that you the data you collect really pays for itself um later in the design process so i think we do need to um maybe drive away from a kind of tick box approach i've got a jacket so i'll do a borehole to 60 meters kind of thing but much more optimized and thoughtful through the process uh, and then make sure we um, the design process or the design methodologies allow for, um, say, a ground model approach 
um, rather than a pure geotechnical data everywhere approach. We, we need to find that balance somewhere uh, and really think about what we're doing. Good, thanks, Neil. I'm sort of aware that we're actually a long way through this process now, and we're going to come on to our listeners' questions in a while. But um, we've had a number of questions in, but don't forget, if you do have questions, can you actually put them um, in the question box, which is just below the media viewer? So um, a couple of things I'd like to finish with the panel discussion, really, is um, thing, things we discussed prior, prior to meeting today was um, what was much more of a global approach to things. How do we actually achieve uh, what we're trying to achieve in a global basis when obviously local content is becoming more and more important? And the other thing I'd like to sort of touch on as well is in the last round of licensing in England and Wales, uh, uh, um, the, the, the costs of leases shot through the roof. Um, what, what sort of impact is that going to have on what we're doing in offshore survey? So if we could take the first one first, and I don't know whether you're in a position, Nadine, to talk about uh, um, how we, we handle things such as local content around the world, um, but whether or not you can give an IMCA resp response to that at all. You know, we're increasingly being asked to, to utilize local content, but they, even where um, the resources are very well developed, such as in Europe and the US, we're struggling to find people. Do you have any comments on that at all from an IMCA point of view? Um, all I can say, um, I, I can't, um, I'm, that's not my, my, my particular area, but I know yeah. that um, IMCA has been working um, closely with um, with the U.S. market and with a number of, of, of different organizations and also been looking at, um, at the Jones Act as well. So, um, so, so there's, there's this further work um, being, being, being done there, but it's, it's, it's not in my particular area. I can certainly, if anyone's who's in, interested in that, I can, I can come back with, with further information just drop me a line at sustainability at imca-int.com and I'm happy to answer that. Yeah, great. Yeah, sorry to put you on the stop. That's okay. On the spot there, Nadine, but um, uh, I'm sure Phil will have a comment on this. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely a challenge that we, we need to look at and step up to and we need to look at it cleverly. You know, I think we, we've had one instance recently where the local content was delivered by have doubling up members of the crew just to, to say we've got some local content. We need to avoid that. Um, but equally, I think it, it's back to, uh, you know, thinking about a procurement perspective. It's very difficult for a survey contractor that's jumping in on one project that he has secured for an area to build up a local content just on that project. So we need to have a better view of the future forward pipeline and maybe moving from individual project procurements to, to, to frameworks where, where local content set as, as a framework with some kind of sort of incentive there for the contractor to have a minimum amount of work that they can then have the confidence to build a local supply chain. The US market is an interesting example because you know this it's not just US content, it's individual state content. And that's that's a big challenge, you know, because we're working across states and we're not going to build that local content in every state. So maybe it's then from an industry perspective to smooth that out a little bit and to focus, you know, that some states are good at different things and that we focus states then for a specific area. So maybe one or two surveys or states that have a survey specialism where we can then build a base to, 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 to develop that local content capability but it is a challenge and i think probably maybe andy sees it a little bit as a challenge as well when you get to some of the other markets that with the local content agenda you maybe don't have the same you you, you almost have to develop an, a, a survey industry from scratch or from a very low base which will potentially impact upon the quality and resolution of the data that you get so it, it, it's definitely a challenge and one to be to be looked at yeah. As someone who works across different jurisdictions, any comment, Andy? Just brief comment on that. Yeah, and uh, I think Phil's right on that. I mean, we we have the luxury in in Europe. We've had an established oil and gas business for for decades, and we've had an industry which has grown and evolved through that process. And I think when we all started our careers thirty, forty years ago, working on vessels offshore, it was a completely different doing the same job but it was a completely different environment and when i look back at some of the photos when i was offshore your your perception of what was safe and what wasn't safe and what was a 
a way of working is is fundamentally different to where we are and i think that the challenge is moving to new frontier areas that haven't got a 50 60 years track record of working offshore um it's it's a difficult challenge to suddenly come and put your your european perspective on that thou shall do it like this when then they haven't had that learning you know not not that the intent to learn isn't there but they don't have a ready supply of dp2 vessels ready to go with drilling infrastructure or and and that's just a process of you know the speed of change of development i mean with you know uh, we, we really weren't that far away from that 20 25 years ago in north sea there was quite a mixture of different vessels we had out there and now now your expectation is a nice nice new build vessel custom built to do what's required and and, and that takes time to for markets to mature to that effect and a, and it, it is a challenge because you're complying with local content, but you're also aware of the fact there's not an established site investigation industry. In, and, you know, some of these countries haven't had really existing oil and gas works and, and our expectations are suddenly jumping straight forward. So, yeah, it's, it's a difficult, a difficult challenge. OK, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Uh, just moving on to the um, increasing uh, leasing costs that we saw quite recently in the uh, in, in um, England and Wales. Um, do you have any comments on how that's going to impact offshore survey and the sort of requirements you need now? Uh, no, I don't really. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it would be quite a difficult topic for me to link up. Um, sorry. Um, uh, okay. We hadn't heard from you for a while. I thought you might have some views on it. I know the likes of Phil and Andy will definitely have some views on it. <laughs> I'll, I'll let them go first. <laughs> So which one would like to take like take this question? I, I mean, I yeah, I mean, I I won't and can't speak about specific numbers, but I, I think just you know everything's what is public domain is public domain. Um, I, I fundamentally don't think it changes the approach. It, it's a cost to development, but I, I think it highlights the fact that we, you know, as an industry, need to work smarter and as, as phil alluded to we need you know we need to go out once and start to get things which which is right and fit for purpose taken through for design and, and i think it really focuses the mind on the approach and I, I don't i don't think it will change where we're aiming and I, I think our new you know i don't think there's any need for an update you'll be pleased to hear nick to make to the uh, guidance notes i think that's captured as, as as neil said with a ground model approach and how we do things smarter as an industry and following that as an approach to site investigation is still fundamentally the correct way we do it i mean you know that's that that's working smarter um you know the less the less man days we have offshore fundamentally the the safer it is from exposure um cost savings in doing it that way and, and actually are we getting data that is sufficient for design and, it, and if we meet that criteria and we can end up with certified and safe designs for the life of a project that's what we should be aiming for not not to you know not not over specifying anything and as you say I mean everyone will have their own approach but I think the new renew renewable guidance notes that any anyone should be able to pick those up and ch choose the was my children keep saying to me pick a lane <laughs> whichever route you decide to take you can pick a pick which way you want to go and you can fast track slow track or, or take it how you how you how you want really it's not a completely prescriptive way of doing anything but the options are all there for optimized approach or a more conservative approach and yeah. and uh, yeah. and sites are very sites are very different you know that the, the geo risks we have on sites globally uh, fundamentally change i mean again from a a North Sea perspective, we don't we don't have seismic hazard risks. We don't have hurricanes. We don't have typhoons. So some of the need for additional data is very much regional on how you manage that as a regional approach. And I think we all know from our years in site investigation, there isn't a one size fits all. You, you need to be smart about your site and understand the risks on each site to, to really come up with what's optimal um, for your development. Yeah, thanks, Andy. I was going to come on to you, Phil, but I noticed time's moving on, and we've got we've got 15 minutes left, so I think we probably need to go on to our viewers' uh, questions now, if you don't mind. So, uh, thanks. Maybe guys. one very quick, one very quick, quick point, point. Like, if you don't mind. Maybe just it might set the scene a little bit, but yeah. 
you know, I think as an observation for the round three sites, the UK round three sites, you know, we they were leased back in sort of, I can't remember when, it was around 2010 or just before that. But we're only really seeing their sort of the, the construction stage is really taking off now. So that's been a, a 10 year process. So I think things will have to speed up. The whole development process will have to speed up both in terms of hitting the government targets, but also in terms of what we're seeing and in these increases in, in leasing costs. So I think there will be a need to, you know, to, to fast track the survey process and to, 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 to optimize the survey process. So sorry to interject, but maybe just no, add okay. Andy. Okay. Yep. Thanks for that, Phil. Right, we move on to our viewers' questions. Um, there's one from John McLean, who's a song, um, who's a self, self-employed, I guess, um, engineering manager who is now retired. Uh, John asks, do the panel believe that the marine sector is lagging behind in terms of preparedness for net zero challenge? What evidence do you have for your assessment? And I guess I'll pass up that one on to you, um, Nadine. Um, I'm going to make a make a comment that in in some respects um, all sectors are lagging behind, and we know this <laughs> because um, I, this this and the reason I'm saying this is because we have just had um, in August the um, IPCC. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so the leading expert and scientists globally, released their sixth assessment report on the physical impacts of, of, of climate change. And they made it clear to us that um, some of the changes now are irreversible. irreversible. So in 2018, we had that special report on 1.5. And I think that this latest report has shown us that even more, that this is not some, this, this, this move needs to move into the mainstream and we need to act quite quite urgently on it. Okay, thank thanks for doing. Okay, uh, we've got a question from Judith Patton, who happens to be president of the SUT. It's one for Phil. Where are the people Phil obviously wants, needs going to come from? So remote, remote centres like few groves to the fore and grabbing all the gamers who relish looking at screens. Any comments, Phil? <laughs> Yeah, apologies, I was on mute there. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely, we, we're seeing this move from different perspectives as the opportunity to, 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 to bring more people on shore. So there's a health and safety benefit, there's, there's an environmental benefit because you don't have to supply that hotel offshore, uh, so there's an element of that. But also then from a perspective of a... Uh, you know, getting people into the industry, but also then extending the life of the offshore people by, by, by positioning them in the remote operation center. So it's, you know, it's it's definitely an evolving piece. And I think the, the COVID uh, restrictions that we've had has fast tracked that a little bit, but in its nature that more of us have had to work remotely uh, and has challenged us as a survey contractor to, to push the, the levels of data we've got around for people to work remotely on the on the onshore. So, so it is moving and there's a definite trajectory in this room. Where are the people? It's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge. You know, I think the, the, the critical thing is to, to, to A, to get people into the, into the sector and, and more important, as important is then to retain them people when they're in so that we don't lose them because their life position evolves and they don't want to work offshore anymore that we, we we create a path for them that they can stay in the industry but have sort of deal with their, the, how their life evolves as well and ensure that we have a proper work-life balance in this so uh, yeah it's 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 a challenge uh, but you know the, the use of remote operation centers is one aspect to this the, the the encouraging people to join the industry and i think that's for us all to do individually but also collectively as the sut or as imca or whoever to sort of push that agenda out around the stem agenda and not just stem but you know how stem evolves into the actual work that we do and how the importance that then that de de delivers upon the decarbonization agenda yeah, thanks, Phil. Just just an observation from Carol Hayward from Wessex Archaeology. Uh, she said, please bear in mind that the majority of the millennial generation is aged 30 to 40 years old now, so times are moving on. <laughs> if, if I could just add one comment quickly to this topic as well, Mick. Sure, I mean, I, I, yeah, I yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, when I 
you know, we, we've all introduced ourselves with our, you know, 30, 40 years experience. And I know when we sit at our OSIG meetings or other ISO standards meetings, I mean, there, there's a a lot of us, I guess, who, who need to be able to pass our skills and our hard-earned knowledge over our careers to that new generation. And, and there, there, there are a lot coming through. But I think I think there's that window of opportunity where there's a lot of hard-earned experience in that early offshore oil and gas days of, of, of what we've done. And, and if we're not getting the, the you know, new new starters, new people as industry coming through, that, you know, uh, one, once people retire and leave the industry, that knowledge has gone. I mean, the, the way of capturing that is through, is through the mentoring of getting people into the industry and working with people who've built up that knowledge. And it's, it's uh, you know, it's hard to retain knowledge once people leave the industry. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point you make, Andy. And I guess really what the offshore site investigation geotechnics group of the SUT does is is attempt to actually to educate and to promulgate that knowledge. And of course, with our, our younger version, our ecosig, the early careers people, um, yeah, we're doing doing a lot towards that. But obviously, what Phil said earlier on, you know, we've got to start at schools. <laughs> it's okay passing on to the people already in the in the industry. We've got to get people into the industry as well. Um, you know, we, we shouldn't underestimate you know development cycle from a from a lease to development. If you're looking up to 10, 12 years for a project. You know how many projects do people have in a career from inception to completion, and you know it's <laughs> it's not a whole lot left. You can start planning your one or two sites completion. It's um, yeah, yeah it's yeah. a long process. Okay, thanks, thanks all. Um, a question here from Sarah Lawler, uh, um, Imca, uh, and this is for Neil. I think how will floating wind change the face of survey? <laughs> Uh, thank you. That's an easier one for me to answer. Um, uh, I suppose uh, you, you put up that um, graph of uh, the growth of wind expected. Uh, and if you look at it in terms of um, seabed touch points, um, floating wind will have a far, I think, a far greater amount of touch points. Um, so not only have you got the turbine itself doesn't touch, but you've got the dynamic cable that's going to have a touch point. Um, that's going to have quite important requirements in terms of touchdown um, engineering, say, for the design life. And then you've got the, the mooring line corridor. Uh, you're going to have to make sure that that's clear. And then you've got the anchors themselves. So if you've got an anchor spread, you've probably got uh, probably a minimum of three anchors, if not maybe more anchors distributed away from the turbine location itself. So the overall area of... Um, seabed that's impacted is going to be quite a lot greater and also you're going to have different um, and sometimes quite complex data requirements depending on exactly what it is what it is you have to engineer and where so i think it's going to um increase it and in some cases make it more complicated thanks neil um question from barney brennan from brennan energy services a consultant the size and spacing of turbines can change during a pre-feed and a feed process as available blade size increases. How do you manage geotechnical surveying when the locations of the fixed structures might change? What surveying are you anticipating with with floating offshore wind? Well, that's that's been partly covered. Um, but do you want to comment on this one, um, Andy? Yeah, and again, pro probably one I can't um, go into too much detail because every one and every project will have its own... Uh, own approach of how that's dealt with and, it, and it, it's really from a risk-based approach and where the project is and, wh and where you predict um, turbines going I mean at, at the end of the day we have to end up getting a, a certified um, site conditions assessment of geotechnical information to take through into detailed design um, and it's at that point either through a ground model approach and how you model the site and really working with the uh, certification body to understand what what level of deviation from fixed points they can accept based on the knowledge you have of the site and that integration of geotech and geophys and and, and some sites with with far greater complexity will need an awful lot more work and it gives you limited time to, to fix and change assets where some other sites which are much much more uh, you know uniform soils across the site um you, you know you, you have got ways of utilizing geophysics to still be able to adjust layouts later on without necessarily repeating geotechnics at every location but i mean that that really comes down to who and who and how it's being certified and at what 
point you need to start making those decisions. Okay, thanks, Andy. Right, I know we're coming into the last five minutes now, so um, we've got a couple more questions. Uh, I think one I'll aim at Phil um, is from Tim Marples, who is now Wessex Archaeology, but I know where this question comes from because Tim, I think, worked for BG in days gone by. Um, he says, has the industry picked up people from deep exploration seismic contractors, which is massively contracted since 2014? Yeah, we're uh, certainly seeing uh, individual candidates approaching us now from that sector, and I think they, they, they can bring value uh, as we develop, because I, as I sort of alluded to earlier on, I think we, we're seeing a little bit of a move from, you know, the use now of 2D UHR as, as a fairly standard approach uh, on the geophysics side, and we're now seeing a little bit of a movement towards the, the potential use of 3D UHR data. Uh, that brings challenges because it's just a, it's to do with the sheer volume of data that we're going to be acquiring and then how you process and interpret that. And, you know, of course, the, the, the deep exploration guys have technologies around that. So we must look in on that and the ability to, to, to adapt that to the, to the environment. So it, it might not be at the, at the same depth as the exploration guys were looking at, but we've got the same challenges of, in terms of the sheer volume of data that we're collecting and how we deal with that and how we interpret that. So I think there is some element of you know, learning and transition across of some automated processes, automated processing, automated picking that we can we can certainly learn learn upon. So uh, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, if there's people there, we're definitely interested to see them because we need these people. Yeah, th thanks a lot, Phil. And the final question um, comes from Sarah Lawler um, at IMCA again, and it's actually for you, uh, Nadine. Um, Sarah says, what impact has IMCA's code of practice had on the industry and is it available to non-members? So the code was just released in, in 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 May, so it's probably a little bit early days to see um to see see the impact. But um, our um, environmental committee um is sort of looking at this and helping members reflect on on how they've been doing on those um, material topics in the code. So they've been developing a self assessment tool so that they can look and 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 um not a formal benchmarking, but be able to see um well where does um X member lie relative to to their um, peer group across the IMCRA membership to see because we need to have a sense of whether we're we're doing better or worse which I mentioned before so we've taken kind of the 70 there's about 70 different um key um sort of good practices or um expectations on our contractors that we've um agreed within the code which again I was developed by the members for for the members and they um they're they're we're going to be able to measure their progress so we'll be rolling out this new self-assessment tool in um in in January now the code's available um to IMCA members, and we have an at a glance summary which is available on on our website. So if you if you're interested in in in, in taking a look, and um, I think that um, we're we're starting to get a number of queries. We've received some um, positive um, press on it, and um, we've also received feedback from um, our end user clients. Um, so so the energy companies, including those um, renewable energy um, companies, have um, we engaged with them in developing the code, and they were um, um, very pleased with the content and, and and said that it was very much aligned to their thinking so so, so i think that's a, a, a real positive so it, only time will tell what the real impact will be that's great thanks thanks to okay so we're just about to wind up so uh um i'd just like to thank our panelists i'd like to thank our viewers and all those who who submitted questions i'm sorry we, we weren't able to answer all of them but we did actually answer the most pertinent ones and also to read exhibition to david Inns and his support team and uh, really just to end on a very positive note, I can't think of a better time to be in the offshore survey industry, to be quite honest. Whilst we're all absolutely snowed under, we've got some great challenges ahead. Uh, um, there's a real interest in what we do in terms of offshore site investigation and geotechnics. And um, I'm sure, as we have done right through the 40 odd years I've been involved in the industry, we'll find solutions to the problems and we'll be able to satisfy those people who wish to utilize this data. So th thanks to all and um, yeah, I wish you a good weekend.